I hope I'm not forgetting any of that. So you can see how varied that, uh, uh, that, that, that the work and the task that is at hand. So the NDP really is the anchor of all of that because all of those agencies in the whole of government and the whole of society is expected to implement. So ladies and gentlemen, without much ado, I would like to welcome the Honorable uh, Minister in the Presidency and the Member of Parliament, uh, Mr. Mondli Kungubele, uh, who will then deliver the keynote address uh, for this occasion. Uh, welcome, Minister. Uh, can you ask and raise uh, uh, a hand of applause? Thank you. Okay, now thank you, ladies and gentlemen. You may be seated. Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay. They put something on my chest, uh, and they told me that once you've got this thing on your chest, don't gossip about anyone. So fortunately, I don't gossip. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Program Director Ntakumba. Very interesting name in our language. Uh, Deputy Chairperson of the NPC in Abstentia, Professor Tinyuko, who is caught up in his inauguration of a Senate chair. And we thought we should not interfere with him in as far as Mashamba that is concerned. Acting Secretary of the NPC, Dr. Kifilwe Masite. Uh, NPC commissioners present here. Uh, the panelist, Dr. Professor Soma Dr. Figge. Did you hear that? <laughs> uh, I asked Busang what is his uh, title, and I got told later that is Dr. Busang. Uh, <laughs> oh, he says I'm wrong. Uh, Professor Mushubie. Maserimule. Not bad, eh? Not bad. Uh, Dr. Mahoba. These are all panelists. <clears throat> you can see how powerful the lineup is. Um, the senior government officials who are here. I've seen Godfrey, I've seen a number of you guys. You are many. You are such a powerful team. Assume that when I greet Godfrey, I'm greeting all of you. Those I don't see. Dagumba was fortunately here. Members of the media, ladies and gentlemen. It is my singular honor to present these introductory remarks at this public engagement of the new, newly appointed National Planning Commission. This NPC was appointed by President Sir Ramaphosa in December 2021 and inaugurated on the 25th January this year. The term of the third NPC is significant in various ways as it coincides with the following significant context. National Development Plan. <clears throat> the National Development Plan review done by the NPC and presented to cabinet, and the president concluded that during that time, that the country's development trajectory is off the course and proposed recoursing the pathways. Relevant to this platform are two critical elements. A capable developmental state requires a professional, appropriately sized civil service. 
currently there are challenges in terms of capacity, stroke capability, frontline services, and professionalizations. Those gaps are well known by all of us <clears throat> that we need fit for proper to manage and run our institutions to deliver as expected. The second aspect is the state capability, which is weakened by the following fragmented intergovernment relations, challenges in right skill, right job, high turnover, limited performance management, and unstable political administrative interface. One is trying to say, <clears throat> If you hear when the review was done and the president looked at the review and said the trajectory is off course, we need to recourse, these two elements are demonstration of the background against or which underlined our ability to stay on course. The other issue is the state of the economy. The challenges in South African economy have over time been worsened by sustained low levels of investment and growth. The economy has also experienced a series of downgrades, including the state-owned enterprises. This has impacted adversely on the cost of borrowing. In addition, low levels of growth and challenges related to revenue leakages have also impacted negatively on resource mobilizations. These challenges coupled with an increasing budget deficit and a rising stock of debt has constrained the fiscal space. The key fiscal indicators demonstrate an ailing economy. For instance, in 2019, the, 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 the GDP growth had regressed from a baseline of 2019, my apology, as we read now, uh, the growth has regressed from a baseline of 2019 of 0.1% to negative 6.4. Unemployment increased from 27.6% to 34.4% as we speak. Employment, the number of people in the employ decreased from 2019 16.3 million to currently 14.9, I think it's no longer 14.9, it's even less than that. Uh, you, will you will actually confirm those facts. Somebody said 14.3, I hope it has changed. Investment as percentage of GDP decreased from 16.9 to 13.6. Poverty level in particular, food poverty remain unchanged. In other words, as we sit here today, we are speaking of the indicators, which are not a good story, which instead of getting better from 2019, they got worse. Although one would say, this is against the background of 2021 economy, which has grown by four plus percentage, which is good news, and also a projected primary surplus in 2023-24 and so on. So the story going forward doesn't look bad. On the COVID, it is well-known fact that, ladies and gentlemen, COVID-19 trusts South Africa and the world into unprecedented and massive, massive crisis. Indeed, South Africa managed to flatten the curve over the past two years, and since the introduction of COVID-19 vaccine, we have seen a significant difference in our lives. Before COVID, we already experienced an ailing economy it will be disingenuous of me not to acknowledge that our economy was ailing even before the lockdown. The persistent shortage and rising cost of electricity has rendered the economy uncompetitive. The impact of COVID-19 on priority sectors such as tourism, manufacturing, and mining has further derailed the country's economic trajectory. At the height of the pandemic, and national lockdown, at least two million jobs were lost. In the final quarter of 2020, the economy contracted by a record 7.2%. Whilst we are still on the throes of pandemic, we should at the same time acknowledge that we're in a better position than we were a year ago. The pandemic and its effect 
are now manageable and well on the road to recovery. We need to remain focused and ensure that we do not deviate from our economic recovery plan. We meet at a critical moment in our socioeconomic lives when our country and the world is pulling itself out of ravages of COVID-19 pandemic. These and other factors have adverse effects on the economic stability of our country. And panel of experts like, experts like the NPC ought to advise government on how to address these challenges of our historic moment. Now, uh, Dr. Suma Dr. Fikin, who will, will already factor in Ukraine and all the uh, related impact. Remember, they supply in terms of food things we are capable of planting and not need that supply. But in terms of oil, those are some of the things because once you disrupt Russia and Ukraine, that's an oil uh, flow, and it means the scarcity and the high price. So those are some of the things which, as we go forward, might have impact in the economy of our country. Ladies and gentlemen, my introductory remarks, therefore, takes due consideration of all the factors that have hindered our development trajectory and seeks to redefine our course of action as we journey towards NDP Vision 2030. The lecture is thus entitled, the, the lecture is thus entitled, open quote, reclaiming and building a capable, ethical, professional, and developmental state. The very title of this lecture suggests that something is lost, something is not going right, and something ought to be done to rectify whatever is wrong. This is an area where we need to be very frank about. We need a candid discussion, robust. I was saying one day when I was opening NPC during the inauguration, I was saying Jack Welch says, I like that. He says, Kenda is a dirty little secret in business. Because if, when it lacks, but the contrary is true, in a candid environment, he says there's an opportunity of a lot of ideas. Two, he says chances of speed are very high. Three, he says life is run at a cheaper cost. So that's why we call for a candid and a frank discussion. It is in recognition of these factors and more that it is important to reclaim and build a capable state. This moment of crisis requires an integrated response where government works hand in hand with institutions of higher learning, independent researchers, the private sector, civil society and labor, and collectively come up with development strategies to ensure that we recover from the current crisis and restore a thriving economy. That is what the president refers to when he talks about the social compact. I'm sure you'll remember that the president said there is no better time that this country, which now agrees that our economy is in dire state, that poverty is at a highly unacceptable level, inequality cannot be tolerated, unemployment is bad, that if this is not the time to work together, there will never be such a time. To this end, I leave you with the following key viewpoints for your consideration during the public lecture, because mine is not a lecture is an opening remark. One, looking at the NTP review and assist the country to develop a pathway to get back on track to social economic recovery. Consistent with the NTP imperatives, 
three of the seven priorities adopted by the sixth administration have a component of infrastructure development, job creation, reduction of poverty, and the growing gap between wealth and destitution require accelerated development underpinned by speed implementation of national. The top priority, a capable, ethical, and developmental, and developmental state underpins all seven priorities of the MTSF. These priorities, the ideal of a strong leadership, a focus on people, and improve implementation capability. This is a big challenge in our country today. We have to work together to improve implementation capability. Keeping the country, number two, keeping the country on track to ensure the seven priorities of the MTSF, which is medium term strategic framework, are achieved. What are these priorities? These are the priorities which the president set up in 2019 when he started his administration. First one, a capable ethical and developmental state, economic transformation and job creation, skills and health, consolidating the social wage through reliable and quality basic services. Special integration, human settlement, and local government. Social cohesion and safe communities. A better Africa and the world. I'm just, uh, something is ignited in my head when I say consolidating social wage through reliable and quality basic services. There's always uh, in the public discourse a narrative that this is an austerity government. In spite of the facts that 59% of our budget goes to social wage. But there is this obstinate stance that <laughs> our budget is austeric against this background. But I leave this for you to debate. Three. Implement, implementation of the Economic Reconstruction and Recovery Plan. What about this? In adversity, so often comes opportunity. South Africa is now on the threshold of an important opportunity to imaginatively and with a unity of purpose reshape its economic landscape. The current conjuncture presents an opportunity to reset South African economy is an opportunity to build a new inclusive economy that benefits all South Africans. This is a moment for a permanent and decisive break with our past of low and decline in growth, falling per capita incomes, low investment, as well as high and deeply entrenched levels of inequality, poverty and unemployment. Through this program, the country is committed to one, growing the economy at a rate of 5.4%, two, reducing unemployment rate to 6%, three, increasing investment as a share of GDP to 30%, reducing inequality as, a, as measured by Gini coefficient at least to 0 0.60, and five, total eradication of poverty. Commitments made by SONA and further elaborated in the budget speech, how will these find expression in the work that will be undertaken by the NPC over the next three years? Implementation of the fiscal framework, clarifying and charting a pathway to fiscal sustainability, and how to ensure fiscal sustainability. Again, this is another highly debated concept in South Africa. Uh, the Minister of Finance said, <clears throat> from the MTBPS, we committed to economic growth and a fiscal sustainability. And he said, we do this by decreasing the fiscal deficit 
and stabilizing debt. To us, the logic is simple. The fiscal sustainability means, amongst other things, that you need to use the money you have. If you have to borrow, you have to make sure that you restrain, you restrain the cost of borrowing within levels that don't obstruct you from accessing capital so that you can, you can continue spending. Because the bigger the deficit, the more costly is borrowing. In South Africa, as we speak today, no less than 300 billion is cost of borrowing. You are taking that, mo that money away from road construction, from water resources construction. You're taking it away from improving infrastructure for development. You are taking it away from infrastructure-led economy. You are taking it to cost of borrowing. Well, those are facts that are there. So that's why we are not prepared to turn our, our eyes on this. And I, I dare sometimes want to say there is a debate of the, what do you call them, the modern monetary theory and the orthodox. It's a debate, I'm not asking that it takes place here because it can divert this, uh, this, <laughs> this summit. Because the modern monetary theorists are saying if you produce your currency and you have your sovereign currency, you cannot have debt because you will produce money and pay it. But there's one thing those who want to follow this line. The MMTs also respect the importance of maintaining the value of the currency, even under MMT. The debate by the orthodox is that if you go to emerging economies, the challenge you have, if you are to throw money in an unlimited way, you stand the risk of failing to pair it with the resources that are produced goods and services that are supposed to, to actually compare with so that you keep the value. Again, I want to say that's a debate for another day. I request that we don't allow it here. Here, what is confronting us is poor implementation to turn around inequality, poverty, and unemployment. But there's always a temptation to go to that. Ladies and gentlemen, a capable ethical and developmental state lies at the heart of our efforts to achieve the goals and objectives of the NDP. Such a state manifests true strong leadership, a focus on people, and a strong implementation capability. Drawing from the NDP, which envisions a developmental cap capable and an ethical state that treats citizens with dignity, the, M the MTSF seeks to establish a public sector staffed with professional, responsive, people-centered, meritocratic public servants that enjoy a high level of trust among citizens. However, as the NDP cautions, a developmental state cannot materialize by decree, nor can it be legislated or waived into existence by declarations it has to be consciously built and sustained. I want to conclude in the following way. All of these efforts are guided by broader government imperatives as articulated in the NDP. In particular, the NDP espouses an inclusive economy that will create more jobs. To quote directly the vision of the NDP is, open quote, in 2030, the economy should be close to full employment, equip people with the skills they need, 
ensure that ownership of production is more diverse and able to grow rapidly and provide the resources to pay for investment in human and physical capital, close quote. This is an ideal that is shared by the National Planning Commission and all other planning bodies in government. Our commitment to this vision is unyielding because the NDP remains our guiding light. It is no doubt that the NDP is a noble and well-considered vision. However, its implementation has not lived up to its promise. With only eight years to our destination, NDP Vision 2030, we must do things differently. It was Albert Einstein who famously said, open quote, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result, close quotes. So we can't run the NDP the way we're doing now in order to, to meet those goals. The time has come to do things differently. We must change the public image and perception of civil servants. There's a correlation between trust in government and variables like GDP growth and public perceptions of corruption. When GDP growth declines and public perception of corruptions are high, overall trust declines. It is about the future of South Africa, the future of our children, and our children's children. Let us join hands and make South Africa the country we all desire. And course. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Minister. Uh, Minister Monde okay, well, uh, Ladies and gentlemen, we classified it as um, an introduction and overview, um, but you, you could sense the depth at which it went. Uh, that's a lot of food for thought. The frank recognition of challenges of our time inclusive of those that the NDP itself identifies, the triple challenges of unemployment, poverty, and inequality, issues of lack of growth, and specific sectors that you went through, and very important stimulating questions. Oh, she has corrected. Uh, some laboring on the academic discourse that he had advised that rather don't dwell much on that, uh, the orthodoxy versus the modern uh, uh, monetary economist. Uh, and a whole range of things that I would like to dilute because the reason that the organizers have brought these uh, eminent panelists was exactly to do that so that as a program director, I just make sure that we move forward. Even if we miss time in between, at least we go out of here almost at that uh, time that's indicated on the agenda. So without much ado, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I think let's give another round of applause to the minister for really that very comprehensive input. Thank you very much, uh, honorable minister. Uh, at this point in time, I would like to invite that uh, item, the poetry. Oh, um, is it? There is poetry uh, that by Sandiswa <laughs> uh, Maduna, where I come from, I grew up in, Maybe in the rural areas of the Eastern Cape. Yeah. And uh, part of what was always encouraged when there is an imbis, uh, which is a traditional type of a meeting that happens on various reasons, there will be an imbo. Uh, but I think they had to stop it at some stage because of the, some of the challenges that emanated with other people in moving around, taking, diluting that very important uh, part of our tradition and culture, which you can see that it's there all over the world. If you think of Shakespeare as an example, he's a poet first and foremost, live alone, there being a writer and everything. Because in there, there is wisdom that comes, there is a sense of taking us to the future, also recognizing the past. So Enimbongi doesn't get introduced where I come from, just 
springs up and say what they want because some were part of it had to do with inspiration and degree of spirituality in there. So ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, in doing that, I just wanted to ensure that you know the value of poetry I know. I in our society, especially I in remember. troubled times. Well, of course, they, they are trying to build something to be debated. Uh, so where is Sandy's? You need to spring up and do your job. Okay? Thank you. Hello there. Hello there. Yes, I am beautiful. See, I am made of amplified curves and succulent breasts. Sure. But it doesn't end there. I am a masterpiece, and if you are brave enough, you shall reach my mind. I am no regular commodity, I am not. Bought with silver and stones appealing to the eye, I am more than dust and breath, now call me woman. For in every stride I take, I tell stories. I continue to retell them with my smile now. Mm -hmm. Tell them, sisters, that even in our pain, we remain oh. strong. Even the stripes <laughs> drawn on our bellies is just the resemblance of the strength we possess, for we are meant to stretch into whatever shape and size we desire, designer. For he who created the heavens and earth dwells in us. Now please, sir, when you come across me, just say hi and call me Prudence. Thank you. <laughs> that was just my introduction. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> My name is Cindy Swamaduna, and I am honored to be a part of this function. I am a youth, and I am witnessing this, and I will tell them at the grassroots level that our leaders are doing something about the turmoil that we are facing as a country, as a continent, and as the world. So I just want to thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Minister. Thank you to everyone who's a part of this event because we know, I know that you are working and like I'm saying, I will tell them. <laughs> the earth is finally cracked open. The blood of warriors, it seeps through the cracks of its foundations, those laid thick with lies, deceit, and dishonor. It is shaking, the ground breaking. Like the walls of Jericho, it is trembling. My grandmother speaks, my mama weeps, my six-month-old daughter, she screams to the top of her lungs. Obituaries are no longer final statements of departure. They are silent cries from beyond the graves. Femicide is not a face. My daughter, Sabelani Isikalo Sabafasi. For my sisters and I, we are stacked together like pieces of wood. Our bodies emit gases of hopelessness. Ngoba na. Ngoba na togozela ugusi rengula ugusi bulala nogushaya i intlizio ze nuza langa zelela ugubula lumfaz. For Karabo Mukwena still speaks. Tsofat Opule and her unborn baby, they weep. The women of South Africa, in unison, we come together. We kneel and we pray that this reality of ours changes. We hope that we give birth to sons of a different breed. That our daughters don't have to go through the same reality as we do. But until then, we will pray 
and hope that the shackles on Eve's feet are loosened. For the earth, the earth is finally cracked open. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam. Uh, as I said, it's one part of the program that you don't debate, but because she happened to have used some vernacular, uh, theme of the last part, which is the gist, because the earlier one's introduction was around femicide and the specific names that she mentioned and uh, the pain that it has caused to our society, to the women in our country and all of us and our sisters, mothers, and the children, uh, the daughters have been maimed and slaughtered by their own loved ones and the closest. Yeah, so I didn't explain why I said in some of uh, the rural areas, Izimbong, the poets, where people decided to stop. It was not necessarily only because of them, it was because of the sensitivity of the new generation, because the Nimbong is allowed to insult you as well. <laughs> so, uh, so some of the new generation was not happy that you would insult an Inkos or something like that. But thank you, sis. Uh, it's a very important input. Um, I've just consulted with the organizing team. Uh, they tied the minister under that chair You'll never find him on Mondays, never, whether you like it or not. But I don't know what the magic they have done, but they said, if you do lunch, you will be wasting minister's time. <laughs> so let's continue to the end so that he can also do his re closing remarks. Uh, otherwise, he might be instructed by the people he reports to to go elsewhere. And at least now he's tied under that chair, so he can't go. <laughs> so without much ado, ladies and gentlemen, we, we, we do have a team of panelists. They are sitting here, but I will request them to come here one by one as they make their presentations. Uh, what I will do is to just briefly introduce them now, and then they will just I'll call the names for them to come through. Uh, the first one doesn't really need an introduction. It's Professor Soma Dodafikeni, whom I think all of you should know uh, because he is a well-known commentator in media. He is a public intellectual. He is involved in discourses like production of these uh, Mapungu, I mean, the, the scenarios for our future, and yeah, he is somebody that has been joining as a public commentator with the New South Africa and before. Uh, just the first paragraph on the note that you have there, just to know where he is now. Professor Somato Dafigeni is a scholar, public commentator, community development activist, and he was appointed at the Commission of the, the Public Service Commission of South Africa in February last year, 2021. So on the 2nd of February, 2022, he was then appointed as the deputy chairperson of the PSC, and he has just now been uh, requested to be the interim chairperson of the PSC. Uh, and of course, then he has, as an academic, studied in uh, very many universities in the country and beyond, and is now currently also a visiting professor at the University Nelson Mandela University in South Africa and has received quite a lot of recognitions, among which is those that are listed in that profile. Without much ado, let me invite uh, Professor Somato Dafi-Eni to, uh, to take the podium. A round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, 
program director, I have this second gadget that we were told we should open before we talk. Uh, program director, Honorable Minister, Gungubele, the fellow commissioners from the NPC, and the executive leadership uh, in a room full of such galaxy of leaders the rector of the National School of Government, uh, fellow panelists, I greet you this afternoon. Molwen Dumelang, Sanbonan, Abshain. I just want to raise a few issues following a very direct clarion call from the minister. Uh, complicated. Uh, I'll just uh, try to get this one out. Emma Klesbeni, we do not have all these complicated arrangements. You stand up and talk. It's such an honor to be given opportunity to share this stage on behalf of the Public Service Commission where I am now, in case you wonder why I've disappeared from current affairs, analysis the space I have been in since May 1992, which was 29 years. In the last three years, I felt I needed to step back. It's always nice to leave the stage whilst the, st the song is still on. Uh, the significance of this lecture coming at this time cannot be overstated. If you just look at the last two years, every other report is so depressing that some of the people have withdrawn from following news. Whether it's a Zondo Commission investigation into PIC, PRASA, new gen commission to SARS, or even in the private sector, the biggest corporate scandal we've ever seen in terms of staying off. It's been a litany of unethical behavior. I just want to start reflecting on what I call are the profound paradoxes of our democracy. Because that is what we're all about at this moment of deep crisis. During a Fed season, we may not have reflected seriously on this. Because now we realize each time an SOE fails, taxpayer must pay. Each time we have a budget deficit, certain services have to be surrendered or deferred. I think this lecture will be worth a while if we begin to deal with these paradoxes. South Africa is being hailed as having one of the most progressive and good constitution. And we do have some of the most celebrated governance frameworks around the world. 
many people journey to come and learn. We have King 1, we have King 2, 3, and 4 of the governance frameworks. And we do have some of the best business schools in terms of training and schools of government, wherein people from around the world and the continent flock in. And yet, we have seen the proliferation of unethical behavior. The question is why? Some of the best policies that we produce, one time I was a keynote speaker of African parliamentarians in Malawi, and they were saying South Africa has some of the best policy frameworks, well-researched consultants have been brought in, and we often go to the internet just to extract them because we know they'll never know we've taken them and just change the names because they do not implement them. So to me, another paradox is each time we invoke the word coordination and integration, be sure that silo mentality, toxic competitiveness between different units is going to follow. And I even wonder, Minister, with the district development model, how you are going to disturb these rigid silos where national, provincial, and local are not coordinated, where different units across departments are not coordinated. So allow me to be provocative in a sense of saying, why everything has failed. Why even Batupile has failed, putting people first. Why has moral regeneration failed so emphatically? We have all these structures which are meant to promote ethical behavior by public servants, by the public in general. But every indicator shows that we have taken them in, recited them, and started moving the other direction. That's why we have taken a detour today as a country. Surely we are not where we were supposed to be, and we are not where we were. We are in time between times and place between places, as Reverend uh, Fingna once said, talking about the state of our nation. I just want to say, maybe time has come for us to reflect on the sources of these, because it's clear that our system has become a patrimonial system where patronage networks have taken over the system. Where loyalty instead of competence is the most rewarding thing. If you get somebody, you appoint somebody in terms of loyalty instead of competence. Something that professionalization of public service is trying to wrestle with has become a key issue. Even the issue of deployments themselves, conventionally that is not a problem if it is known where it starts and where it ends and there is competence. But the problem now, it has degenerated into literally the patronage networks sometimes factionalized. But what is to be done? We recognize, Minister, 
the efforts to reform and to capacitate entities such as the NPA. We recognize, Minister, the professionalization framework that the National School of Government has been crafting and the review committee uh, which Prof uh, will be speaking to the chairperson. But the question is, how will they be different? What conditions are we preparing so that we begin to see real tangible results? We are a country that is fascinated with meetings. An over-conferenced and an over-workshopped country. When we realized that in the last meeting we called it Lihotla, we called the next one Indaba, the next one we say it's a Bosberat, the third one we say, and so forth. Have we come to understand as the elite that we are here that this is a good PR exercise or have we become honest about wanting to change? Because very often it's not for the lack of meetings, it's not for the lack of documents, it's not for the lack of policies. But something has happened to allow for these profound paradoxes. Maybe we have even mastered the art of saying the right thing and doing the wrong things. Look at how the Auditor General has been issuing reports after reports. Irregular expenditure continues. Wasteful expenditure continues. This workshop, therefore, or this seminar, we should be reflecting on what must we do to change that mindset. Before I make the last two points and sit down, I am reminded of two scholars. In fact, the other one is a businessman, not a scholar. Warren Buffet says, chains of habit are too weak to be felt until they are too strong to be broken. When these tendencies come in, we don't feel them. But when it is too late to break the chain, it is too late, we can't, the chains have become so heavy. So what are the things that we among ourselves have learned but we refuse to admit that these chains now are too big for us to break because routinely we have done these things. For example, look at how many people have privately complained about this COVID-19 and now working from home. They say, I used to make a lot of money out of travel allowances. Now, this travel allowance dependency makes one not to wait for invitation, but to Google for invitation. <laughs> and when you are permanently away from the office, because you want to notch that 40% of your salary, which is travel allowances, who is doing the work? By the time you come back and the pile is up, do you do the thorough review? before you approve. Somewhere these chains have to be broken. The second quotation was by another sociologist who wrote Alvin Toffler. I think it was the third wave or the future shock, one of his books, where he said the illiterate of the 21st century will not be the people who cannot read and write, but people who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. 
our inability to unlearn the wrong tendencies that we have inherited. It's not the big names that you see, the obvious ones in the Zondo Commission. But it is the sum total of all of us when a police officer in a metro refused to go into an intersection where traffic lights are not working, instead hide under the bush where you can ask for 50 rands, pretending to be doing work. When we ourselves create travel to a point where we've been desensitized to the fact that your travel your hotel, somebody could have been given that money to start a spaza shop, a barber shop. <laughs> and I wonder, Minister, if the problem is also not how we've mastered the systems. The cynical compliance regime where people demand bonus because I have not stolen. As if you were employed not to steal <laughs> instead of reading your mandate. Stealing ought not to have occurred anyway, but in nowadays, look, the AG says I have not taken money, I want my bonus. And yet, the houses you wanted, I'm happy at least now the predetermined objectives have been factored in. But the cynical notion of saying, if I comply, instead of saying, if I effect the mandate, it's one of the unethical approaches to this. I also wonder if the convoluted compliance and regulatory regimes have not disenfranchised and disarmed the public for knowing what is happening. Every other sector in its compliance has a book that is 800 pages. You need a consultant. You need experts. Even when you want to tell somebody has done something wrong, they say, you can't say this, you need a lawyer. The lawyer needs 6,000 rands to just put a sentence whereas, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> but I want us to actually walk out of this meeting saying, how do we make the promises, the frameworks, the policies, become something that we internalize in our ethical landscape. In an intrinsic fashion, where no one is watching, you behave ethically. Because whilst at the PSC, Minister, nothing saddened me the day we had to write letters to ministers to say, some of your officials are fingered in stealing 350 rands. Some are chief directors. This 350 that people queue up whole night next to post offices. We're a country that needs a moral code. Because the levels of greed have reached a cancerous level. We no longer see petroli fufunyane. We no longer can control ourselves sometimes from doing wrong. And the most fascinating thing is that even those who have done wrong, from public officials up to the highest levels, they don't feel a sense of remorse whatsoever. They want the next opportunity. And that, to me, this workshop would do well
if we say, how do we resolve these paradoxes? And the crisis moment we're in is the best moment to attend to these problems. Many other countries have turned the course when they never allow a crisis to go to waste. But collaboration between different role players is key. The problem is that PSC will do monitoring and evaluation. Your department minister will do monitoring and evaluation. You find that parliament is doing monitoring and oversight. And we are pulling from the same fiscus. And you'll find that we have five reports on the same thing, but we never sit down to talk about how we coordinate. Because this is a lean season. We no longer have the surpluses we once had. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Prof. Uh, Somato Dafigeni, um, for that provocative input. I will just pick up on one, the agreement with the minister that this is an opportunity. Minister says it's an opportunity to reset the economy. Prof. Somato Dafigeni says it's an opportunity to change our habits, not talk the right things and do the opposite. Uh, without much ado, I would like to invite someone who is representing the DG, uh, DPME, uh, DG um, Robert Nguna. That's the DDG from the Department of Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation, Mr. Uh, no, you are confused here. Sorry, they sent me your profile through the, 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 the the system, but I would rather just talk freely. Uh, you don't introduce Amar Pagati comprehensively when the king is around. <laughs> Mr. Godfrey uh, Mashamba is a very seasoned public servant. He has two masters, a strong background in economics. He has served uh, in different capacities in the public service until where he is, where he's the head of a branch in the DPME called Evaluation Evidence and Knowledge Systems, uh, which deals with issues of data, with evaluations, as well as the research that informs decision making. He is passionate about that area of work and drawing from also his experience in science and innovation systems, broader research and development environments, national statistical systems, and so on. So without much ado, let me just uh, give over to Mr. Mashamba to take the podium. Thank you, sir. Thank you and good afternoon. And uh, program director, honorable minister, the chair of the National Planning Commission um, and the commissioners, colleagues, distinguished guests, um, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Um, it's always awkward when you get introduced and they read your profile. I was like, is this me? All right, uh, thank you. I stand here today as delegated by the Director General of the Department of Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation to make an input on behalf of the DPME. Um, and I was asked to speak on the 
issue of interdepartmental coordination, I, which I think is an issue that must be looked at uh, from different dimensions. But I only chose to to talk touch on three issue, three issues dimensions of that, which are uh, responding trying to respond to the remarks that were made by the minister, um, and also um, reminding um, the colleagues of the introductory meeting that the minister had with the commission when um, they joined, uh, they were introduced to the department. Um, the three issues are coordination expected between the national departments. The second one being the coordination that is expected between national, provincial, and, and local government. And also how government um, coordinates, different parts of government co coordinate themselves in engaging a private sector and the civil society. Because I think those are, are, are very big issues. They, 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 is, they present themselves in different ways. Uh, very well-known problems of coordination that happens in those spaces. That the dynamic is an ever present problem of coordination that needs to be revisited over and over again because the context changes and requires us to adapt. Um, so the minister remarked that whatever the di disruption uh, that we face, we must not divert from a sustained plan of national development. Um, part of that is to be on the alert of how the context is changing and the nature of problems it throws at us. Um, furthermore, the minister also said, reminded us of the danger of path dependency. Maybe not using the same words, but he reminded us of the danger or tendency to want to continue with what we know. I, Dr. Nasuma uh, Tafikin also remarked on that. Is that how do you coaching? How do you expect a different outcome when you continue doing things the same way? So with that said, the think tank in the NPC must be frank with identification and characterization of the problems we face as a country, uh, because that is a sure way to make an attempt at actually finding solutions to the problems we face. That is very important. And the problems of coordination, as I said, they are well known. That is why major policy uh, initiatives of government, they've always acknowledged this. Um, I mean, the NDP itself in the chapter on, 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 on governance, it does acknowledge these problems as a persistent problem that requires constant attention. I, we know about the system of ministers and DG clusters. Uh, it has been there for quite a long time, since the 19, uh, 1998, somewhere there, with the formation of Fawcett. But the problem of coordination is still, still there. So I'm reminded of the recent study that we did to evaluate the functioning of the clusters, which makes recommendations that are not even a surprise to us, Minister. <laughs> Uh, one of the recommendations is that the minister and the presidency must um, provide leadership on that particular issue uh, to make sure that uh, we realign uh, as, as government in that space. The MTSF makes important inroads in that space. Um, I mean, it talks about the efficient and integrated government, and there's an issue of a single public service uh, that we always speak about, but um, how do we actually do this in practice? In the MTSF, you'll find that um, the MTSF does take the points that the minister has made about 
um, the priorities of government that were contained in the 2019 SOMA and also in the manifesto of the ruling party. It takes them, articulate them under uh, seven areas, including the, the mainstreaming of, of, of um, a, a issues to do with gender, women, uh, youth, persons with disability. But it, it goes further to say each of the activities or deliverables under each of the priorities. Um, having said that, it also goes further to say who are the supporting departments because that means coordination is built into a system of planning. Um, and then there are structures such as clusters that forever meet and discuss these things. The outcome delivery forums, which uh, brings together a number of actors in the space to see how implementation is actually going. But uh, there, there are still problems there. So which means that we need to give this continued attention. The district development model uh, has been introduced, led by Procter, as a model that uh, need to help us to improve coordination intersphere. A, from national, provincial, up to the district level or municipalities, so that we can see how national aspirations convert themselves into what happens in a street corner, in a village somewhere. So these are mechanisms that are in place. So there must be Apologies for that. <laughs>